We're talking about the churches of the New Testament. And we're looking at those churches as patterns and examples for us today. If we want to be a church of Christ, what a better way to head out to say, we're going to be a church of Christ by looking at the churches of Christ we read about during the times of the apostles of Christ. And there's things we can draw from them, some of them direct examples. Sometimes we'll draw inferences from what we have read and seen and, and kind of see what we need to be because we need to be like those churches. So we've been looking at this, how the church had spread throughout the Roman world. Now this isn't everywhere it has spread, but if you know where those arrows are pointing, you'll see Jerusalem and Samaria and Damascus and Antioch and uh, Galatia and Macedonia. And now dropping down from Macedonia is that white area we're going to talk about tonight, the region of Achaia. And then after that we'll talk about the churches of Asia. We've already had that lesson on the church at Rome. Achaia. You may not be familiar with that word Achaia as well as Greece. We think of this as the area of Greece. But in the Bible it's called Achaia. And so that's what we're going to be calling it here. And the three churches we want to look at tonight are the church at Athens, at Corinth, and Caesarea. So let's look at this. Paul came down from Macedonia in Acts chapter 17 and he came to Athens. His spirit was stirred when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons in the marketplace daily with them that met him. That word disputed, that indicates that there was some opposition. There was some disagreement. It wasn't that he's getting into some kind of bickering contest or name calling contest like we sometimes think of as disputing. But as Paul's manner of preaching was, he would lay out logical arguments and reason with people from the scriptures about what the truth of the gospel is. So that's what he's doing when it says he disputed with them in the synagogues. And certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And this resurrection is really what enticed them. Well, the Greeks had the idea that you go off into this uh, neither world of the dead and you can never return. And yet Paul was preaching a resurrection from the dead. And so they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Areopagus. Well, that's a Greek word for Ares. That's Mars. And Ocubus, that's a hill. This is, it's elsewhere. The, their next verse, I think Paul speaks to them at Mars Hill. You can go to Athens, Greece today. And just down the hill from the Parthenon, and you're familiar with that famous old building, there is another little hillside there, and it's on that hillside that's called the Areopagus. And the story I've been told is that you could pretty much say whatever you wanted to say in the Areopagus. It's sort of a free speech zone. So you could go to the Areopagus and you could preach and teach whatever. They wanted Paul to have that free speech. They said, bring us, talk to us about this at the Areopagus. And so these philosophers came, Stoics and Epicureans, those who thought life was all about just discipline and doing your duty, and then others who thought life was about pleasure and getting all you can out of it, and all these human philosophies. They were the men that thought you could figure out what you needed to do in this world by just thinking it through. And they rejected the idea that God had to reveal truth to you. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 through 14, Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's knowing the things that are revealed to us. 
which things also we speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I think the American Standard Version there says putting spiritual things, and that's those spiritual ideas and thoughts and doctrines, into spiritual words. And so that's the inspiration and revelation of God's truth. He says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Well, that's the Epicureans and the Stoics. They don't think you wait until you get some kind of revelation from God. No, you're to sit here. You've seen that picture of the man thinking. And you just think it through based on your experiences and what you observe in this world. And and you figure it out yourselves. And they reject the idea that God has spoken to us. Now that's who Paul is talking about. And when he goes there to Athens to speak to these people... He has gone to the very heart, the very cultural heart of the ancient world. Well, that culture that that was at Athens, it, it really became the Greek culture. And as the Greeks went about the world, that's where that culture went. And the Romans that then conquered the world pretty much adopted the Greek culture. So it goes back into the deep history of the culture of the Roman Empire to show up at Athens. But Athens was far from its ancient glory. It had fallen. And yet the history of what that city once was and what it meant to the thinking peoples of the world remained. And now here is where the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to enter right into that cultural heart. Paul is going to speak there. I understand you could go there to Athens today and get on that Areopagus and there's a great slab. And on that slab is engraved the words that Paul spoke that day to the Athenians when he preached. If you ever go to Athens, Greece, I want to see the Parthenon and then I want to stand in the Areopagus. You can stand very near where Paul stood and maybe even read aloud off of that slab, that sermon that he preached. I'll show you part of it here tonight. He said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions and found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him I declare unto you. Someone told you you're too superstitious. You worship ignorantly. Well, that almost sounded like an affront, wouldn't it? Something is lost here in the translation. Uh, Paul's method of preaching was never to try to insult the ones he's trying to teach. When he says you're too superstitious, I think the American Standard Version translate that, translates that, I perceive you are very religious. It really comes across more of a compliment than of a criticism. And when he says that you ignorantly worship him, well, they had an altar to the unknown God. There's obviously something that they said they did not know. And again, I think the American Standard Version says, whom you worship in ignorance. We might say, the unknown God who you worship not knowing. Not knowing who that God is. Not knowing how that God would be worshipped. And so don't think Paul is insulting him as he begins these words. That, that may come out in the King James Version translation of it in the way we would use those words. But, but that was not Paul's intent. He's after their hearts. I tell you, you want to win people's hearts. You don't do that by beginning with an insult, do you? Now, you might be able to win some arguments by using some insults, but we're not trying to win arguments. We're trying to win souls. And that's what Paul is here doing at the Areopagus. Well, he preached to them, and at the end of this sermon, he said, We ought not think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. At the times of this ignorance, see, that's what they don't know. This unknown God. At the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So Paul preached repentance. 
in Athens. And then he preached a judgment because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. And then he preached the resurrection whereunto he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. That's the conclusion of Paul's sermon. Well, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. That just didn't fit the way they thought. They couldn't perceive how the dead could rise from the dead while all their religions and, and customs and superstition was, no, you're dead and you go off and you never return. Here Paul's preaching the resurrection of the dead. They mocked. Others said, we'll hear thee again about this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be of certain men clave unto him and believed. Among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Notice the reaction. Preaching the truth of the gospel. Some mocked. Some said, well, I'll hear more about this later. And some believed. Somewhat reminds me of the parable of the soils, the different hearts into which the gospel came, and the different reactions that occurred. But not many believed. It mentions Dionysius, Damaris, and others how many others I don't know he must have left just a small little church there in Athens later when he would write a letter to the church at Corinth he'd say in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26 not many wise men after the flesh are called not many mighty not many noble well now they all get to hear the gospel call but it's but it means that it doesn't appeal to them They've got too much in store in this world. They're too stuck on their own smarts and their own things. Why, this is foolishness unto them. So not many. Jesus began his sermon preaching, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to enjoy the blessing of the kingdom of heaven, it takes humility. If I were to ever write a book on hermeneutics, that is the correct understanding of the scriptures, rule number one will be humility. I think rule number two would be context, but I'd start with humility. Well, Paul leaves Athens and then he comes to Corinth. So here's the second church we're going to talk about. And when he came, the city of Athens is wholly given to idolatry. Well, you can say about the church at Corinth that it is wholly given to immorality. We read about some of the plays that the ancients would do. It was kind of their entertainment to put on these plays. And a lot of times in those plays, when there was a very immoral person, that person's identified in those plays as the Corinthian. That's kind of reputation this city had. The city wholly given to immorality, even famous for its immorality. When he came, he was kind of scary to go into a big city like that. You remember how Paul had been beaten and threatened and thrown in prison and ignored and mocked. And now he's coming to Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 3, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now, that's what they prized in Athens, you know. Or are you highly educated? Can you talk in our scholastic language? And can you impress us with your own learning? It's not how Paul came to Corinth. But then he said this, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He shows up at Corinth after being in Athens and he's kind of scared to preach there. But the Lord spake to Paul in Acts 18 and verse 9 through 11. And then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in the city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. We read how he was teaching. Acts 18 and verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath 
and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. That's how he did it. He didn't come up and impress them. Oh, look, I am the great Apostle Paul. Look at my credentials. Look where I've been to school with Gamaliel. I, I'm a Jew with the Jews. And, and then try to impress them with who he was. And neither did he sit here and try to stir up all their emotions into some kind of a emotional frenzy. So people jump over the pews and water in the sawdust and hold up their hands and shout and yell. That's not what Paul was doing. He reasoned with them and then persuaded them. He spoke to them like they're intelligent people. He appealed to their minds and their understanding. And then he would plead with them to become obedient to the gospel. Now that's the way you do it. That, that's the way the gospel goes into all the world. If you want to be a church of Christ, find a preacher that will reason with you out of the scriptures and then persuade you to become obedient to what is written therein. And it was effective. In Acts 18 and verse 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Many compared to those few up in Athens. In 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17, Paul said this. I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus. See, that's who he just mentioned. Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Every now and then somebody will pull that little phrase out and say, see there, we're not supposed to baptize. Christ sent me not to baptize, but preach the gospel. Just preach, don't baptize anyone. But that can't be what that means. Because Paul baptized Crispus and Stephanus and those of his household, and he could have baptized some others. So what does it mean when it says Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach? Well, you have to understand elliptical statements. Once you know this, there's so much in the Bible, the way it's written, there's just so much that just come alive and just things that would baffle you that just make sense now. And it's a manner of expression that we don't commonly use ourselves, but was very common in that day. And what you do, you're implying some missing words when you use an elliptical statement. Let me fill those words in and you'll see the genius of this. Christ sent me not to baptize only but to preach the gospel also. So many times if you see a baffling statement in the Bible like that, put the only and the also in there. And the way this is said, that statement, is the emphasis is on the also. It doesn't mean he wasn't to baptize. I'll give you another one. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That means it's wrong to have a bank account. That means it's wrong to have a retirement fund. Oh, no, 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 no. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth only. Lay up selves for yourselves treasures in heaven also. And the emphasis is on the also. So Paul's mission was to preach. But the result of that preaching, many believed and were baptized. Now, Church of Corinth had a lot of problems. Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to deal with their problems. They were carnal. They were divided among themselves. Following after preachers instead of following after Christ. They had problems with uh, the way women were behaving in the church. They had problems with members taking each other before the, the pagan courts and suing each other to see what they could get out of each other. They, they had problems in how they were using their spiritual gifts, each puffing themselves up as, oh, I've got a better gift than you. But they had problems about, about fornication in the church, even such that a man had 
his father's wife. And they were puffed up. It's like they were proud of their tolerance. They had all kinds of problems at that church of Corinth. You know why? Because of the city of Corinth. They were taking people out of this environment and bringing them into Christ. And you know they brought all those problems with them. And that's what happens to us, isn't it? You take a church that is growing and they're growing because they're reaching out into the area around them and people are being baptized into Christ and I'll show you a church filled with problems. Because all those people need to be taught. They need to be nurtured. They need to grow. And the church of Corinth wasn't such one. It's all right to have these problems. No, Paul wrote that letter to say, look, you got to deal with this. I was mocked and ridiculed one time by a preacher when I said we need to restore the churches in the New Testament. Restore the New Testament church. And his mock was, <laughs> well, what church you want to restore? You want to restore the church at Corinth with their carnality and their fornication? And he started listing off all these problems. And I told him, well, I'd rather be a member of the church of Christ in Corinth with all those problems than the finest denomination in town. Look what Paul said about the church at Corinth. He opens this letter in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, and to the church of God, which is a car in, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all in every place that call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Look how he ends this epistle. 1 Corinthians 16, 23 through 24. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. When I read how this letter begins and how this letter ends, that tells me I'd like to be a member of that church. That's why I want to go worship. But what about all those problems? Well, we deal with the problems. That's what we do. We teach and admonish one another. And people can overcome those problems. And that's why Paul wrote those letters to help them through their problems. I tell you, they were doing some things right. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Remember how he told the church at Thessalonica he praised them for keeping the ordinances and said you're an example to all the churches in Macedonia and Achaia and now here at Corinth. Look, they had a lot of problems but they were keeping the ordinances. You read through that book and you see what some of them were. They were taking the Lord's Supper. They were gathering together on the first day of the week. They were giving when they were coming together. They were doing some things right. And Paul would build on those things. Now, when they took the Lord's Supper, there were problems with how they were doing it, but at least they were trying to do it. And so they were keeping the ordinances. If we want to be a church of Christ, that's what we need to do. We need to look and see what God wants the churches to do and keep those ordinances. That's why we gather together on the first day of the week. That's why we offer the Lord's Supper for all that want to partake. That's why we have an opportunity to give. And this was a giving church, as I'll show you. And in dealing with their problems, Paul taught them this. You exercise discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 through 7. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the whole leaven that you may be a new lump and unleavened. If you can't bring them to repentance, I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to let them know you can't be in fellowship with this church. We're going to deliver you to Satan. It's not that we want to kick you out. You need to see just how bad this is. Because we want your spirit saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
And we do that with the idea of one, we want to keep the church pure, but second, we want to win back the erring brother. And then in 2 Corinthians, we see that that brother did come back and Paul was writing about how they need to love him. So there's some good things in that church at Corinth as well. First, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, that second letter he wrote is a word letter of much more encouragement. Now he did address the rebellious faction, but mostly that's words of encouragement in 2 Corinthians. He says this, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's the direction that church was going. And they were a giving church. He wrote two chapters about giving. Now he's admonishing them to follow through on the commitment they make. But in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he's purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. We want to be a church of Christ. We want to be a giving church. And joyful that we have opportunities to give. There were other churches besides Athens and Corinth. Some of which we don't read about directly, but, but evidently the gospel went out from those churches out into the area round about. So there may be the, the countryside of Achaia littered with, with country churches or folks meeting in folks' home out in the little towns in the countryside round about. And to the church of God which is in Corinth with all the saints that are in Achaia. So it wasn't just Corinth. 2 Corinthians 11.10 as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. It wasn't just Corinth. And we know about one of those churches. We read about it in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16 and verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. You ever get a good Bible map out, you can find Sincrea, find Corinth, and then look at the seacoast. And right on the seacoast is a little village of Sincrea. It was a shipping point. It was a docking point. The ships headed to Corinth would come into the village of Sincrea. There they would unload and the goods would be taken on into Corinth. And there was a church there in Sincrea with a, with a lady named Phoebe. A servant of that church. She's the one that carried that epistle. Paul wrote while he was in Corinth to, to Rome. And so we see in the churches of Achaia, women had an important role in that church. A subservient role, but an honorable role in the churches of Achaia. Well, that's where we have it. Three more churches now. Athens, Corinth, and Sincrea. I want you to notice how those churches begin. Begin with the preaching of the gospel. Those that received the gospel and believed were baptized. And just like Acts chapter 2, there were added unto them those that were being saved. So that's how those churches began. And they had all these problems. It, it was a perfect plan filled with imperfect people and they dealt with their problems and they grew and they became more and more what Christ wanted them to be. That's the model for us to follow. We preach the truth of the gospel. We keep the ordinances as they're delivered unto us and we grow in Christ. And we just outgrow our problems. We deal with them and we outgrow them. Then we're the church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. That's who we want to be. And so we extend the invitation tonight. Why be part of any other kind of church other than the kind of church you read about in the New Testament? That's our Lord's church. 
And no man can start any church that could ever be better than the one for which he shed his blood. So if you want to be part of that, then listen, Jesus rose from the dead. And he did it so he can save you from your sins. If you'll hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and obey the gospel. So with this, let's stand and sing our invitation song.